Elden Ring is finally here, and it's glorious. With its vast complex open world, expansive magic system, crafting, ashes of war, spirit summons, jump attacks, guard counters, and much, much more, it's a big shiny playground of endless possibility for wide-eyed challenge runners to go wild in. Which is cool and all, but then I found this, and there was only one question I could possibly answer. Can you beat Elden Ring as Sonic the Hedgehog? Um, mostly, I guess? Let's briefly go over the conditions. This isn't an all bosses run. I just need to beat the game and anything else I do is for fun. I can only damage enemies by rolling at them. The Lightning Ram Ash of War would therefore be my main means of damage, but not the only one, as you'll see later. There are only two times when I will break this rule. The first is to kill the Scarab to obtain the Ash of War in the first place. And the second is... well... yeah. It's time for Sonic to finally get his hands on the biggest gold ring of them all. Welcome to Skyring! We've got Angry Tweety Pie, Barbecue Smo, The Shrine of Amana 2, The Shrine of Amana 2, 2, 1v1 me on Rust Bro, The Asylum Treeman, Dragons, 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 Your Mum, and why does this place exist? I guess some things never change, so I gave myself a totally unfunny name, made myself look fabulous, picked Hero as my starter class for the high strength and lightweight fashion, and the Golden Seed as my gift, because why not? After voiceover guy was done climaxing to the cutscene, I ignored the tutorial, because after all I have played this game one whole time already, and I stepped out into the glorious landscape of Azeroth, ready to seek the Master Sword and reach Whiterun to defeat Sephiroth. Okay, I'm done. Let's talk about the setup. Much of Elden Ring's vast world is accessible right from the start of the game if you know how. So, there's a hell of a lot that you can do before fighting a single enemy, and I wanted to make the start of the run as easy as possible, given what I knew was in store later on. It should go without saying that I grabbed every map fragment, Sight of Grace, Golden Seed and Sacred Tear I passed, but I've said it now, so please don't ask again. I also made sure to loot every graveyard I found for consumable runes, as these would be important. Having said all that, here are some of the highlights from every area. Sega! In Limgrave, Vare called me a maidenless soyboard beta cuck, I ignored Gyobu, bought a torch from the Grinch, met Melina, picked up the whetstone knife at Gatefront, met Little Miss Charisma at Stormhill Shack, grabbed some shards from the trolls, picked up the flask of mixed physic from the Third Church of Marika, visited Castle Hate for one half of the Dectus medallion, visited Castle Morn for no reason whatsoever, fell in love with a smurf, looted Morn Tunnel and Nimgrave Tunnel for shards, tested gravity for research purposes, yep, still working, observed a furry taking a shit on top of a tower, popped down to Blackreach to unlock a couple of graces, got invaded by Bloody Finger Orange Juice, watched Yura spectacularly fail to solo him, 5 out of 10, must try harder adopted plan B and ran away, and finally helped a friendly pot dealer to get out of a sticky situation and turn his life around. Phew. Alexander's quest is actually an important one for this run, but more on that later. I was just about done with Limgrave, so it was time to take the Vape Express to Bugtown before crossing the Swamp of Aeonia and hitting the next grace to trigger my invitation to the Round Table Hold. Wow, this party sucks. Back to Kaled. I rode around avoiding everything and unlocking every grace I could, looted Gale Tunnel for more shards, and headed to Fort Faroth to avoid the Hellbats and get the other half of the Dectus Medallion. Kaled had made me see red, and I was feeling kinda blue. So, I skirted around the edge of Stormvale and visited Leonia instead, where I picked up the Glintstone Key and unlocked the Academy, grabbed some more shards, died to a rune bear for an... 
Arteria Leaf? Thanks. And rode up Bellum Highway to the lift of Dectus to show off my shiny new medallion. Finally, I had made it to the Altus Plains. Ah, breathe in that glorious air. So invigorating. I did the usual tactic of opening up as much of the map as possible, got invaded by some random loser, grabbed more shards from Altus Tunnel and Sealed Tunnel, as well as the Smithing Stone Miner's Bell Bearing 2, which is a lot of words to say not very much, and picked up two of my most wanted items for the beginning of the run itself. The Icon Shield, which is in Woodfolk Ruins, and the Lightning Ram Ash of War, which drops from a Scarab Beetle around here on your map. Lastly, I returned to Limgrave and bought a humble wooden club from the nomadic merchant on the beach. Perfect for not hitting people with. Sonic Lives. My map looks something like this by now. Of course, through the magic of video editing, I made my path around it seem a lot smoother than it actually was, given that the game had only been out a week or so and the wikis were even more inaccurate than usual. If I drew my actual path, it would probably look a bit more like this. Let me also talk you through my thought process on the build itself, as random as it might seem. Firstly, the Ash of War. From the small amount of testing I did, Weapon Base AR itself seemed to have no impact on the damage output of the Lightning Ram. So, a small dagger will do the same as a bigger sword. The two things that do count are the weapon's upgrade level and the scaling. From what I could tell, picking the affinity that best matches your stat spread will perform better than just sticking with the standard lightning affinity. And, as I wanted to be able to use a great shield, I decided to go down the strength route because big unga bunga, etc. The icon shield needs 22 strength to wield, is fairly lightweight, and although it's not the sturdiest and only does 95% physical damage reduction, the health regen effect makes up for that, and would come in handy for some ideas I had for later on. The club gets good pure strength scaling on a heavy affinity, and also doesn't weigh much, so would mean I wouldn't need to dump a whole lot into endurance early on. All clear? Well, I thought so, until later on in the run at least, when I discovered that things probably weren't that simple. Fuck me, right? I popped all the runes I'd picked up on my travels to give myself a cool 41k and used all the shards I'd collected to treat myself to a plus 7 club and some levels to kick things off. Time to go and test this damage out on a basic bitch enemy, I guess. Ha ha, yes. Time for Maggie, who is actually a great first boss for learning how to exploit the Lightning Ram properly. He has lots of fast combos, pace switch-ups and delayed swings, but he also has a couple of attacks that leave guaranteed openings afterwards. Lightning Ram has a very slow start-up during which you're completely vulnerable, followed by a period of hyper armor as you start the first roll, but once you're rolling, you have no iframes and won't be able to break out of the roll until it's complete. So, if you pick the wrong moments, you'll eat a face full of delicious death. Which is why a great shield will also come in useful. On the plus side, you can change the direction of your roll, and because of your low body position, you can actually roll right under and around some attacks, which helps. After three or four attempts trying to figure out all the safe openings, it was time to make Margaret fall over for the last time. Well, the second to last time. Or the third. Look, I'll shut up now, yeah? Margit was dead for the moment, but of course you can't spell moment without omen, so I was sure we'd meet again. In the meantime, however, I took the money and ran, spending it on buying enough shards from the twin husks to get my club to a juicy plus 11. 
On my first playthrough, I probably spent 7 hours exploring Stormvale, which is around 6 hours and 45 minutes longer than this visit took, cause ain't nobody got time for flaming murder birds or angry chefs. I left Gostock alive, because I had no intention of dying anyway, made sure to grab the Iron Wet Blade en route, which would allow me to change my club's affinity to heavy, and made my way to my first shard bearer of the run, Godric. A man who heard that women like six foot guys and took it a little bit too literally. Although this fight took more attempts for me to figure out the safe openings than Margit did, that was largely down to the fact that Godric has a really annoying habit of going straight into his tornado whenever you commit to doing, well, anything close to him. Once I'd figured him out, however, the fight played out much the same as Margit, with me rolling around his animations to apply multiple hits at once when I had suitable windows. Godric had a fit of gamer rage, smashed his own controller, and then replaced it with a cheap copy from Wish.com. So, I carried on rolling into him until I reduced his HP to zero before he reduced my HP to zero. Oh, that's cute. Get Godric rolled. Gostock showed me his impression of that scene from American History X. Finger reader Enya gave me some lore gibberish about two fingers and a tree or something. I opened the path from Godric to Leonia for no reason whatsoever and turned my thoughts to Shardbearer number two on the list. Imagine planning a run beforehand. I could never. Renala was the next shard bearer I intended to roll to death. So of course, I indulged in a random series of activities instead, because that's the order in which they entered my head, so deal with it. I picked up the two fingers heirloom in Leonia, as I figured it might come in useful later. I took a trip down to sunny Redmain, where I caught up with my boys Blythe and Alexander. I went up to Altus again to grab the Great Shield Talisman, which boosts your guarding ability. I returned to Limgrave to give Neregis his just desserts, entered Murkwater Cave and spared Patches, because he's a good lad really, and I'd also need him later. With all that done, I finally hit up the Academy, aka the Shrine of Spamana. What a joyous time. Luckily, the mages here have the poise of a wet sock, and my damage output was good enough to be able to take them out relatively quickly. Oh boy, I sure do hope they don't put a cracked out love child of Sif and that bloody wolf from DS3 that also spams spells in this game. Miyazaki! This actually turned out to be fine and only took me a couple of attempts. Red Wolf might be fast, but it has a couple of exploitable attacks that leave its flanks open for repeated rolls. My damage was high enough to not drag the fight out too long. The pesky wolf was put back into its kennel, and with the rest of the academy now open to me, I did the only obvious thing. I went somewhere else instead. Why am I like this? Look, nobody wants to hear me listing a bunch of things in order anymore, and I'm all out of jokes, so have it in an easily digestible musical package instead. You're welcome.
Stop throwing books at me, nerds. Man, Rinala's fight is one of the most visually beautifully composed experiences From have ever made. Of course, it's also piss easy. Take out the crawlies to burst her bubble, roll at her till she goes boom, try not to get destroyed by flying furniture, repeat until phase two. Once she goes into magic fireworks show mode, just avoid the laser beam, dodge through her other attacks to close the distance and punish. Run away when she summons to drag the summons away from her before closing the gap again. Unless she summons the dragon, in which case, uh, just run away. There's no shame in it. Several rolls later and the battle was over, the next great room was mine and Queenie went back to auditioning for her role in Death Stranding 2. Freak. After making sure to claim my second talisman pouch from Enya, it was time to address the scented elephant in the room. Yeah. The entrance to Lane Dell is blocked by the Draconic Tree Sentinel, and I'd been worried about this fight since the beginning. Horse combat is obviously out of the equation here, but the main problem is his moveset. Put simply, once he's in full flow, he gives you virtually zero windows to attack, given how long the start up to lightning ram takes, combined with its lack of range. I had a couple of attempts just to assess the situation, and quickly decided that was a big old nope. Luckily, there was another path I could take, which I'm sure would be easier. Right? Right? What an absolute unit. Did you know that he taught himself gravity magic just so he could keep riding his little horse, Leonard? That makes him the greatest boss ever because Reddit said so. I gathered up the boys for law reasons because, of course, as you can tell, I'm all about the law and we charged valiantly into the fray as one. Every single drop of all you got Every single drop of all you got Radan? Radon. Wanna hear a joke I just made up? I'll just assume that's a yes, I can't hear you. Does General Radan prefer vegetable stew or beef stew? He prefers beef stew because it's meatier. Good joke, but not as much of a joke as Radan is now post patch. Look at the mask of my boy. Blythe fangled hard. Alexander had an emo moment. I hit the gym to get hench and took my buffed up self to Rani's rise to seduce my new quadrupus waifu. Blah blah, evil witch, blah blah, hidden treasure, got it. Uh, when do we get married again? Oh look, a giant scary pit in the ground. I should probably go down there. I made my way down into Nokron, fought the mimic tier in battle, and proved to myself that I am, in fact, the best version of myself which is kind of worrying. Went to Night's Sacred Ground and recovered the Finger Slayer Blade, gave it to Rani in a show of my undying devotion, and then headed to Renna's Rise and walked to Noxtella. This area might be a load of old balls, but for now, I was only here to get some Smithing Stone 6. All right, mate, no need to get all antsy about it. After that, I indulged in some more random activities. I gave D a knife, which made him mysteriously become unalive. Fia, did you see what happened here? I grabbed the bull goat talisman to see if more poise would help. I got the dragon crest shield talisman from under the back of the bestial sanctum. I promptly decided I could do better and got the plus one version from Sainted Hero's Grave instead. I took out a falling star beast just outside Lane Dell in a glorious ballet of death. Look. A win's a win, even if it's also a loss, right? Now give me those smithing stones. I gave Garank some death root to get the claw mark seal, which would be useful on my build as it has strength scaling. 
I lived up to my namesake by going fast all the way through Mount Gelmere, taking in the sights on a whistle-stop tour of bosses you can completely ignore, like this guy, or this thing, or another one of these fuckers. Not today, Satan. I'll take my chances in Volcano Manor. I spoke to Tanif for the drawing room key, went back to Limgrave to ruin Tree Sentinel's day just because I felt like it, and it was time for the gargoyles. Easy first try coming up. Is it the fight that's a big janky mess? No, it must be me that's underpowered. I went back to the manor and explored for more Smithing Stone 6, as well as grabbing some Smithing Stone 7 from Caleb. I also killed the Stone Digger Troll boss for absolutely no reason that I can fathom, but I took the footage anyway, so here it is. Then I made my way up to the Shaded Castle to face off against Elamor of the Briar. This boss is an absolute arse, and his boss room is even worse. Fuck your tables. After a few attempts, he was downed, and I treated myself to the Briar armor, which is this game's equivalent to the armor of Thorns from Dark Souls, and does a small amount of damage to enemies when rolling at them. Perfect. Was it any good? Hell no. But maybe the real treasure was the friends we made along the way, or the runes. Mainly the runes. With a plus 19 club and the deadliest armour in the game, <coughs> I was definitely ready for the gargoyles this time. Yep. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Thanks for blowing poison on the floor literally any time I have the remotest opportunity to attack. Fuck this unbalanced mess of a fight. It was time to swallow my pride and do the only sensible thing at this point in the game. Cheese that absolute shit out of the Draconic Tree Sentinel. You see, if you hug the left and circle around crouching, you can end up right behind him without him even noticing you, which allows you to get in a few attacks while he's still starting up. Then you just dodge him, hop on Torrent and run away like the absolute pussy you are until he deaggroes. Simply repeat the process, and in the matter of a mere 21 minutes, you can put down this minor pest. I'll gloss over the first attempt where a troll sniped me when he was one hit from death, because I deleted the footage in a rage. Easy peasy, don't know what I was so afraid of. Finally, I was here a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed hedgehog in the big city, just looking to make an honest living. Or I could just kill everything in sight. Melina thanked me for the ride and gave me five stars on the Uber app. I headed to the fortified manor to grab the flightless bird painting and dispatched Golden Godfrey fairly easily. The reason I'm glossing over that fight is because I might as well go into more detail when we reach the real deal later, since this is just the basic bitch version. Shardbearer number 4 on my list was just a short walk away, but as always I had other things to do first. I levelled up my claw mark seal and headed to Hemwick Charnel Lane to grab the fire's deadly sin incantation, which is only available after collecting the flightless bird painting. This incantation lets you set yourself on fire, causing damage to both yourself and your enemy on contact, which is another reason I picked up the regen shield earlier. There are also some more shenanigans you can get up to with this spell, but I'll save that one for later. Unfortunately, it requires 19 faith to use, and I was nowhere close for now, so it was about time to open up the best farm in the game. I returned to Rose Church in the Urnia to speak to Vare, who told me to go and fuck up a few people's days. On it, boss. Guys, I'm glad you're all enjoying Elden Ring, but please, please, please level vigor. With three invasions completed, Vare gave me a cloth to soak in a maiden's blood, which I promptly did at the Church of Inhibition in Northeast Leonia. And for my troubles, he cut off my finger and gave me a very special backstage pass, which he told me not to use, but fuck that guy. Now the real concert begins. 
These sleeping little fellows are Albin Aurex. They drop 2k each on death. Sweet dreams, I guess. I farmed enough to pump my faith to 19, grabbed the plus two Halig Drake Talisman while I was in the area, and then went from the shittiest area in the game to, uh, the shittiest area in the game, to collect as many Smithing Stone 7 as possible, of which there are quite a few here. Oh boy, I can't wait till I actually get to the shittiest area in the game. Or even the shittiest area in the game. With my club at plus 22, and my sexy blue body on fire, I was ready to finally face off against Margit again, who this time decided he was actually called Morgot and showed me his upgraded sword to prove it. Things went a little like this. With Morgoth laid to rest amongst his kin, I got even more lore from Melina, and it was time for Sonic to hit the snow zone. Hmm, I thought this area would be friendlier than this. For now, the only things I did of note here was to grab another bell bearing from Zamor Ruins, unlock Castle Soul, witness a touching reunion, and reach Flame Peak, because I had a few loose ends I wanted to tie up before the fire giant. And by loose ends, I actually mean murder sprees. Tanith was so impressed by my dedication to the cause that she gave me an express ticket to Serpent Daddy, and it was game time. Like I implied before, this fight is pretty much impossible with my build. On the other hand, it's one of the sickest fights in the game, and I wasn't going to deny myself the pleasure, so I picked up the trusty Serpent Slayer and duped it out with Snake Daddy the old school way, because it was about time I actually had some fun on this run. I also dispatched Commander O'Neill, finally managed to come last in the Gargoyle threesome, took the Coffin Express to Deep Root Depths, where I think FromSoft might have run out of colour palette ideas, and killed the ants for some well needed rune arcs. I was almost ready for Fire Prick, but I had one more trick up my sleeve to prepare for first, and for that I would need the Morning Star, which can be found in the Weeping Peninsula as well as the Blood Flame Blade incantation, which drops from a scarab in Leonia. You see, casting Blood Flame Blade on your weapon, and then setting yourself on fire, has an interesting side effect. The bleed from the Blood Flame is transferred to the fire on your body, allowing you to prop bleed on enemies by simply rolling at them. And, with a weapon that does natural bleed as well, this effect is amplified, as demonstrated here on our good old friend Grail. Oh, thanks for the free runes too. Now that I had every trick in my arsenal finally at my disposal, this should be simple, right? Well, no, it actually still sucked. Fuck this guy. Come back here, you big ginger bastard! Lord almighty. Whilst the bleed proc is a nice idea in theory given his ample health bar, each time you bleed him, he builds up resistance. And after a couple of props, the resistance becomes too high to effectively use the strap before the incantations run out. After some frustrating attempts, I finally figured out a viable strategy to maximise my options, and it was game time.
prepared to commit a cardinal sin. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. What's the worst that could happen? Very well. The one who walks alongside flame shall one day meet the road of destined death. Okay, well, I guess that's the worst that could happen. Crumbling for Amazula reminds me of the Dragon Shrine in DS2. It also fucking sucks in another cheeky throwback to the Dragon Shrine from DS2. I worked my way through what felt like 6,000 Beastmen enemies, explored a bit, Hello there. died a bit, and reached, you know, that part of the game. Now, let's talk honestly for a second. The Apple Pill Couple fight is worse than running barefoot through a field of Lego. This fight is worse than being caught masturbating by your mum at your granddad's funeral. This fight is worse than trying to fight Melania with this build. No, wait. Anyway, you get the point. I have no idea what kind of space crack Miyazaki was smoking when he came up with this hot mess, but keep it well away from me. On paper, this is Ornstein and Smo Redux. Only, Smo is just as fast as Ornstein and has attacks that reach halfway across the arena, occasionally decides to roll around for three years while Mr. Stretchy does his yoga routine until you die of boredom. Oh, and both bosses have multiple lives. Cheers! I knew that sleep could be effective in this fight, so I grabbed St. Trina's sword from Kaled, as its weapon art casts a sleep mist at enemies that does no damage. I would also need a boost to my int to be able to wield it. So I took the inverted statue Rani had given me to the Carrion Study Hall and proceeded past all the BS to the top of the Divine Tower of Leonia, where I picked up the Curse Mark of Death from Wifey's real body, as well as the Stargazer heirloom for a 5 point boost to int. As it turns out, that was a fucking con. The sword is effective if you cast the mist and then use the lingering buff on the sword itself to hit the duo. Unfortunately, using the mist alone took far too long to put either godskin to sleep. So, like all of the tibia mariners I'd encountered so far, this strat was dead in the water. There's only one way to fight bullshit, and that is with twice as much bullshit. I summoned Banal, made myself look smoking hot, and rolled my way to victory. I said, I rolled my way to victory. I said... With the godskins finally dead, nothing could stop me now. Apart from that. Or that. Or that. Or... Yeah, look, there are lots of good things to pick up from this part of Faram, but two events in particular interested me. The first was a reunion with my good pal Alexander, who is such a nice guy that he decided to sacrifice himself in noble battle just to give me his fresh wet goopy shard. This talisman greatly increases the amount of damage your Ashes of War do, and would remain equipped for the rest of the run. The second was a run-in with Banal, who invaded me to thank him for subjecting him to an hour's worth of godskin attempts. Banal drops the Blasphemous Claw, an item that can be really useful in the next boss fight. Of course, I ended up not using it at all, but hey, it looks good in my inventory. With my club now upgraded to plus 24, I was ready to take on the Beast Clergyman. Turns out I was in fact not ready to take on the Beast Clergyman. Holy shit, this guy's relentless. And initially, it seemed like I would get zero windows to be able to get my lightning ram off. Wait, that sounds really wrong. Well. After a couple of hours of trying out different strats, experimenting with positioning, and all of that nerdy stuff, I finally settled on a tactic for phase one, which was reliable enough as long as I got good RNG to go alongside it. I picked two of his moves to punish. The first is when he scrapes his knife through the ground in a semicircle roll through his scrape to end up somewhere around his flank and you have enough time to start the ram roll. The second is when he does a series of knife swipes followed by a big slam down. I used the shield to block the fast swipes while staying close, dodged the slam and fired up the weapon skill. Everything else, 
stay the hell away. Here's where the RNG comes into play though. After each of those windows, he'll do one of two things. The good one involves him launching into another combo that allows me to direct my rolls at him in such a way that I can do prolonged damage without him hitting me at all. The bad one involves him leaping away and lashing out in a sign of ultimate disrespect, usually ending in me wasting my attack window and copping a slap in the mouth for my troubles. Haha, ha, that was fun. I sure do hope phase two is easier. Well, at this point, however, I had a minor revelation. Remember how I said that setting the Ash of War's affinity to match your best stat gave the best damage output to the weapon skill? Well, that still held true when I had tested my heavy club at plus 15, but somewhere down the line, it seemed that the lightning affinity had actually overtaken it. And since that gives a C scaling in dex, but only an E in strength, I went to Renala, respect to the forbidden stat, and it was time to finish off the best fight in the game. Malekith was dead, but somehow still alive at the same time. Laindell had really let standard slip, and Sir Gideon was a spammy, irritating, spammy, annoying, spammy gobshite. Did I mention spammy? Good thing you can just skip him by hopping up this conveniently placed tree branch. From Soft and Tree Skips, name a more iconic duo. Time for some more assorted business before the final stretch, so please sit back, relax, Munch on some lovely boiled prawns, enjoy. me. Okay, okay, hold up. Let me make one thing clear. There's no way I was attempting Melania with this build, but this area is well worth unlocking anyway because there are some really good items to be had here. On the other hand, this area is also well worth avoiding like the plague because, well, it basically is the plague. Thanks FromSoft, I love getting almost one tapped by an ant at 50 vigor. I headed down the branches of Fuck You Thought This Was, across the rooftops of Suck My Dick, past the mages of Have A Terrible Day, and took down Loretta first try because I'm a boss. Oh, and also because she's literally the easiest thing in this entire area. The main two things I was here to collect were the Pearl Drake Talisman Plus Two and the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. I figured I'd give Mrs. Trump a couple of attempts anyway, just for laughs, since I was here. Um, yeah, no, I'm good. I was so close to the end I could smell it. Or perhaps it was the fact I hadn't showered for days. Either way, Mr. Stompy was another sizeable barrier in my way. 
so I prepared myself for battle. Godfrey's first phase is identical to his golden form, and there is one particular moveset that's eminently punishable. Although, as with the Beast Clergyman fight, there's also a hefty slice of RNG involved. As long as you stand the right distance away from him, Godfrey will sometimes thrust his axe directly forwards into the ground, and he will either follow it up by going straight into a spin, or by pausing and pulling his axe up again. Roll through his first attack to end up close to him. If he goes straight into the spin, dodge through it as well, and then wind up lightning ram to punish. If he stays still, he's going to pull the axe out, so again, you can punish. Now, the RNG. Sometimes, he'll follow those two moves up with a combo that you can keep rolling right under and around. Other times, he'll combo straight into his foot stomp, and if you committed to the roll at that point, then enjoy getting shish kebabbed by the earth itself. Phase 2 is much the same, except for the fact he'll stomp 700 times in a row before pulling out the punishable attack. So, if you enjoy spending 5 minutes of straight dodging just to get one attack window before rinsing and repeating, then this is the fight for you. Not gonna lie, his stomps are extremely satisfying to dodge, but Jesus dude, when is it my turn? After a while, I could consistently get through the Godfrey phase, but once Angry Harlem Globetrotter Father Gascoigne comes out to play, it's a very different story. Hora is more relentless than probably any other single boss in the game, meaning you have virtually zero windows to ramroll without tanking. And he barely even gives you any windows to buff. So Bleed would be my best option, but I would need to make sure I cast Fire's Deadly Sin just before the phase transition to make the most of its effects. I also decided that at this point in the game the shield was fully redundant, since everything hits so damn hard anyway. So I shifted the extra points across to <clears throat> Dex and prepared for war. You don't scare me! If you ever had any doubts that George R.R. R. Martin had any involvement in Elden Ring, then here comes Nazi brotherfucker Moog, Lord of Blood, to slap those thoughts right out of your head. For a Lord of Blood, he's actually hilariously weak to bleed, so the potent combo of Moog's shackle, found in the subterranean shitting grounds, lightning ram, the purification physic, and my flaming bloody Cheeto's body made ridiculously light work of his first phase. Nihil this, you cradle snatcher. I gotta say though, this stage show is next level. Your dedication to a live performance is outstanding mode. Now, stand still and let me kill you. There we go. I don't want to rip apart Miyazaki's creative vision, so I'll try and say something nice about the Lake of Rot. Um, it's pink? Yeah. Oh, and it's got my favourite boss design at the end of it, in the form of nostril, anal beads of the void. This cute little fella really is quite... something. I wasn't sure how easy or not this would be, given how floaty Astel is and how distinctly unfloaty I was. But, in reality, his face stays low to the ground quite often, and he leaves himself open for counters there after several attacks. So this was actually pretty straightforward. 
I met up with Smurfette afterwards. She gave me my reward. Thanks, this is completely useless. And I was ready to return to the Erd Tree for the final showdown. They say it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. But I'd spent long enough on this run by now, so it was definitely about the destination. And my destination was Marika, who is actually Radagon, who is actually the Elden Ring, or something. Varty, help! Anyway, Radagon is a great final boss, and this is a fight in which you really do feel like you're fighting a god. Like the last few fights beforehand, this one is definitely a case of picking a move to punish and avoiding everything else. Radagon is even more erratic in how he will switch combos than the previous bosses, however. And if he read my application for an attack window and denied it, then chances are I was going to get turned into holy pancakes, since he hits like 10 trucks tied together. A little tip for anyone struggling with this fight, jumping is your friend here probably more than any other fight in the game. Even attacks where it feels more instinctive to dodge, like his Holy Spears, are actually a lot easier to avoid by jumping. The RNG in this fight is wild too. Sort of like Orphan of Koz, most of the time he'll start by edge walking you and doing slow melee attacks. But maybe every four or five fights, he'll just go psycho hellspawn mode right from the bell. Those ones are probably a write off. After a couple of hours of trying to understand all his patterns and which were best to punish, I finally landed the winning blow and the last boss was defeat. Wait, um, what the hell is this glowing space condom that looks like a five-year-old drew it? Oh, well, that's fun. There's only one way to deal with bullies and that is to be a bigger bully. Please don't listen to my advice. I went back to Elphale to farm some more levels to pump into faith, because it's less boring than slaughtering a field of sleeping Cole Pilkingtons over and over again, and I bought the Lord's Divine Fortification Incantation from the Twin Husks, which gives a whopping 60% reduction to holy damage, and can be bought from them once Maleketh is dead. Since Radagon and Elden Beast do holy damage, this massively nerfs them. Go on, hit me all you want, pussy. Okay, maybe not that much. All right, let's finish this. Radagon was, uh, Radagon? And Elden Beast was Elden Deceased? And I need a new scriptwriter. I'm firing myself. I contemplated Fear's ending for, ooh, 0.3 seconds, before obviously picking Rani's because it's the cool one. The end cutscene played, and it was done. I had mostly beaten Elden Ring as Sonic the Hedgehog. So, did I learn anything from this? No. 
Should you do it? Also no. Go get Rivers of Blood and Mimic Tear and Comet Azor and Rock Breath and play the game like everyone else for God's sake. Don't be like me.